when your body has been trained in a martial way, it translates to anywhere, basically in any martial art, because there's only so many ways you can do things. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 155, and thanks for dropping in. On today's episode, we hear from a historical European martial arts practitioner with the deep roots in both karate and Aikido, Mr. Charles Murdoch. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host for the show, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time here. Many of you know we recently rolled out a new color for our sparring gear named Horizon. We have some great new photos of that gear that you'll see popping up on really everywhere that we post photos, you know, our, our whistlekick.com site and, and some other places. But for right now, you can get a sneak peek of one of those photos over on the show notes page. There truly is nothing like this color on the market. And we're really excited that we were the ones to be able to bring it to you. We exhibited at an event recently and people went insane for this new color. We sold out of nearly everything we brought. It was kind of crazy. And we've never seen a response to anything we've done quite like this. Those show notes I mentioned, those are at whistlekickmartialartradio.com. That's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. In each issue, we send out some special content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive podcast episode. The more time I spend with this show and meeting martial artists in person and virtually, the more I realize the lines between location and style are really blurry. It's from these blurry lines that today's guest comes to us. Instructor to a personal friend of mine, Mr. Charles Murdoch is a practitioner of historical European martial arts, often called HEMA, who started life with Asian martial arts. He talks to us today about those roots and what he's up to today and how it all comes together. Mr. Murdoch, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. It's really an honor to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you. And you were here as another... We'll, we'll say representative of a, a smaller martial arts community that, you know, personally I find fascinating and that's the European martial arts community. So looking forward to hearing some of your answers, some of your history and stories as it relates to, you know, let, let's face it. When we, most of the world thinks about martial arts, they think about karate, they think about Taekwondo, they think about Kung Fu, but there's so much more. And one of my personal goals with this show is, exposing people to other types of martial arts. And that's part of why you're here today. That's great. Again, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Now, we get started in pretty much the same way every time. It gives us some context for whoever we have on the show. How did you get started with martial arts? Well, you know, I, my dad was uh, a martial artist, among many other things. And so that oh, he always captivated my interest. I had seen pictures of things he'd done and different things. And he never really started teaching. He'd show me little things, but he never really started teaching me. So an interest was generated there. On the other side, you know, I was 12, 13 years old, reading books like Lord of the Rings and going, hey, I want to do that. Like, I want to wield a sword and, and do those kinds of things. And, you know, you look around and there was really nothing there that looked like that. And so the closest things that I could find were in the Asian martial arts. And so that was the direction in which I went. And I was probably, I was 13 and a half years old, I think, when I started. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper there. I mean, okay. you know, I, I don't think there's anybody on the planet, especially a 13-year-old boy that doesn't want to learn how to swing a sword and hold a shield. And, you know, I think most of us have done that with, with friends, if not with sticks, with uh, used up right. toilet pa uh, uh, paper towel tubes and, right. and wrapping paper tubes. I remember that, you know, we just had Christmas and using up the wrapping paper re reminded me of that as a kid chasing the dog around. But certainly there was a little bit more formality at some point along the way. So how did you find your instruction and, and what kept you in it? Yeah, so that was a very, very long road. Um, you know, I started and I was a you know, freshman in high school and I started with Henry J.R. Shambo. Uh, he was an instructor of Shito Ru in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. And, you know, he had pictures on his wall of him with Bruce Lee and him with Chuck Norris. I'm like, huh. This is a pretty interesting guy, you know? And so I started training there, and then it was a series of martial arts, um, mostly Japanese arts, 
from Aikido to different styles of karate as I moved through my life through college and grad school and different places that I had to shift styles and shift instructors. Um, and it eventually came to styles that taught more weapons. And that's where I really started getting interested. Um, you know, I really didn't find the HEMA community, which is the historical European martial arts community, until probably 2008. So I was pretty far into the martial arts career when I finally found that community. And it was um, still early, relatively early. I mean, there were events happening and things still growing. And, uh, and now it's, it's really on the move at this point. Um, so it's pretty exciting. It's exciting to be part of it right now. Cool. Cool. So 2008, you get started now. Have you, this, this, this may be a, a, an abrupt choice of language. Have you abandoned your other martial arts training? Does it find its way in some kind of a mix? I think that, I don't know if I would say I've abandoned it because how can you abandon the body mechanics you've developed? How can you abandon, like there's things that you couldn't put aside. Mm. You can put aside, you know, like doing kata and particular techniques and things. But um, when your body has been trained in a martial way, it translates to anywhere, basically in any martial art, because there's only so many ways you can do things. There's only so many ways the body can generate power. And it's all applicable. So I would say it, it probably melded into um, what I'm doing now. And definitely, I mean, I, I don't train those arts anymore, specifically as arts, um, because then my focus is on the European martial arts, and it is vast <laughs> when you look at it. There's a lot to do. Yeah. So it's fascinating. Cool. Interesting. So that gives us a bit about who you are and and everything. And I, I know we're going to learn more about you and your training and, and the whys. Okay. Excuse me. I think the whys are the most interesting part of, of any of these episodes, at least for, for me. But we tell a lot of stories here too. So take a moment. Tell us your best martial arts story, whether it's HEMA related or, or from your past. Well, I mean, I've had so many experiences in martial arts, but some of them, you know, one of the uh, the best martial arts stories that I that I have had in my life, and it's it's a little bit secondhand, but it was uh, it was from my dad because my dad had the opportunity to train at the Kodokan in Japan back in about 1947-ish, wow. and you know he was stationed there um, in post-war Japan, and he was able to get two black belts, but so he always it was an inspiration to me in so many ways. But the story, and it's a funny story, because, you know, my, my father grew up in the 30s, and he was, during the Depression, he was always fighting as a kid, and all of those things, but he got himself to Japan, and, uh, you know, he was in the military, so he felt pretty good about himself and his ability to fight, and he said, they get inside the Kodokan, and this, this doddering little old Japanese man comes out onto the mat, he goes, anyone want to try and throw me? And my dad was like, sure, I'll do it, you know? <laughs> And he said, so he went at this guy and he said, I ended up on the other side of the dojo. And he said, you know, the matter I got, the further I flew. And he said, the more that I went after this guy, and he said, that old expletive threw me from one end of the dojo to another. I mean, <laughs> and he said, so that was really the beginning of him understanding there were a lot of ways to fight. And that that sort of aggression piece was not always the way to go. So for me, that's a martial arts story that's always stuck with me is that there's always somebody out there that you can learn something from. And no matter where you think you are, there are people who will throw you to the other end of the planet <laughs> and then wake you up. And so that's, you know, for me, it's always stuck with me. Wow. That, that's, you know, it's almost like a Kung Fu movie. Right. Right. right? Yeah. You know, just that, that kind of classic archetypal little yeah. old man that you look at and think this guy can't do anything. You know, it's Mr. Miyagi. Right. Well, <laughs> and, then, and, and it was, it got worse because he said he would, you know, being who he was, you know, you know, an American and you're in Japan, so they don't know the etiquette the protocol. He would just stroll into the dojo and he said, this old guy would be stretched out above the doorway and drop on him, <laughs> you know, in the midst of training sessions, <laughs> just take him out. And so, uh, you know, it really opened his eyes to like, wow, you know, here's this guy at this age, here I am, this young, you know, 17 something, 18 something guy, you know, and young and tough and vital. And this old dude's just putting him away all the time. <laughs> But it sounds like that strategy worked for him if he ended up earning a black belt. He, yeah, he, he learned. Too. Yeah. 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 Cool. That was great. Yes, that's something that's always stuck with me. All right. 
So other than martial arts, what do you, you know, what do you do? Do you have any hobbies? I, yeah, you know, I enjoy, enjoy outdoor activities. I like going hiking and camping and just, you know, being out in the wilderness in some way. That's definitely one of my hobbies. Um, you know, I, I have two sons, one 18 and one 14, and they both have a love of the outdoors and doing things. So that's another thing I love doing is just spending time with them. They're both really, uh, really great kids. Um, you know, my, my older son had an interest for a good deal of time uh, in the European martial arts as well. So I tra- I've been training him for a bit, and he, um, he's really come along. Uh, you know, in the last six months, he's been really inactive because he's trying to finish up things in high school. But overall, he's, uh, he's become quite a martial artist as well. So spending time with my boys, doing stuff outdoors, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I, I like to travel as well. Travel is a good thing. So those would be my hobbies outside of uh, doing martial arts. Cool. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's always interesting to me when a parent starts passing martial knowledge down to their children because, you know, that's that's the way it used to be. It was kept within the families. And, you know, we've gotten away from that in America. And, and you know, I, I haven't done extensive martial arts. Tra- I haven't done any actual martial arts training outside of the, the country. I, I've talked to some people who have, yes. but it doesn't sound like it's, you know, that much different anywhere else. It, you know, we, we've kind of moved to a this group class environment, but I think there's something really special about passing that down, you know, with your, with your name, so to speak. Uh, and, and I agree. And, and even, you know, my, my 12 year old, who's now 14, most 12, he's 12 when he, he did some training and he was really, um, at that point he was not confident enough to pick up a larger long sword. So I began to train him in some of the one-handed sword techniques from the martial arts and historically European martial arts. And he really took that for a while. And then, you know, as kids do, they, they wander away a bit. And I expect that he'll also return to it someday and come back and say, Hey, can you show me more of this? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, may, maybe he'll go on to college or go on somewhere else and, and have those positive memories. You know, it's, I, I always cringe when I hear about people saying that they force their kids to do anything. Because, of course, you know, we've, we were all kids and we know what kind of an impression that left in our minds. And right. the last thing I want anyone to have a bad impression of in their mind is martial arts. There's, there's one, one caveat to that though, for my oldest son, um, he's also now an amazing cellist and I wouldn't say it was forcing, but it was really strongly encouraging him to continue at certain points that got him through these humps where he was feeling down about it. And now sure. he can pick the cello up, sit with people and play anything. Wow. Um, so, and that for me is just, it, that's just a gift you can't, you know, you can't take away ever. Like that's something that he's going to have forever. Yes. Yeah. And it's certainly, it's a fine line yeah, and it's, and it's one that every parent has to, has to navigate for themselves. Definitely a fine line. I agree. I'd like you to think about a time in your life where things were difficult, challenging, whatever word you want to use there. And tell us about how your martial arts experience helped you overcome it. Well, there's a good, yeah, you know, it's really interesting there. Um, I think any time that things get tough, a friend of mine um, and a person that I trained with a lot when I was out in Arizona, Billy Restucci, he's a great uh, martial artist as well. And, you know, he always had this idea of these, these, three, these three legs on a stool. Um, you had your work life, you had your family life, and you had your training life. And that when something was going off in one of them, you could always lean on the other two. And for me, that is something that also stuck with me in that so that if, you know, if I felt awful in training and things weren't going right, then I could really lean on my family and my work. And if things are bad at work, I could come back and lean on training and family. And that's something that's always seemed to work because you always have things to support you through those hard times. Um, So when I found it, I mean, there's always other aspects and things that can happen. So I found that in, in those times, um, you know, say there were financial issues or whatever, you know, I would just go and train really hard, <laughs> you know, and you'd feel really good all of a sudden go, okay, all right, this is going to work out. I'm going to get through this. You know, if training was bad, I would go be with my boys, go on a camping trip, do something, you know, just, just to, to just get away from it and get perspective. Um, and I think that piece of philosophy that, you know, I think he, probably passed that on to me somewhere 
in like 1989 or 1990 has really carried me through a lot of those difficult times that we all have. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when you say difficult time training, you know, I, I have some ideas of what, what you mean by that, but tell us, tell us about that. You know, it's, it's something I think we all experience, but I, I'm going to guess that there are people listening that may not realize that that's what they're going through. Yeah, there's there are always uh, there are always frustrations. There are always plateaus. I think, and there's always places that you feel like, why can't I move past this? Why can't I advance? Why doesn't this technique work for me? Or sometimes there's just like a bad week or a bad month where you feel like you're just falling over yourself all of a sudden. No matter how much experience you've had, you run into those places like you know I feel like my body's not functioning the way I want it to. Like what's going on? And uh, you know, there are definitely some difficult spots. And then there are sometimes psychological frustrations. You get burned out. You know, you're, you're doing the same thing or you're probably trying to get a technique down. And sometimes, like anything else, too much of anything can be a, a bad thing. So you tend to burn out a little bit and you need something to rejuvenate you, to refresh you, to get your mind and your body and your spirit sort of back in line to what you're doing uh, because you've been thrown out of balance in some way. And, mm -hmm. you know, so for me, there are those times in training and it's funny, it's funny we're having this conversation right now because I'm sort of experiencing a little frustration right now in, uh, not necessarily my, I guess in my own personal training life, I've been doing a lot of teaching and I'm like going, I really need to focus on my own training as well. And so what I've done is I've set up a few, um, weekends where I'm going to other instructors here in the U S and I'm just going to have them train me like, okay, we're going to train, we're going to train. And uh, so I have two weekends in January coming up. And for me, it's what it's going to do is re-inspire me in my own teaching and in my own training. And so yeah, it's, 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 this is a very um, good timing for this discussion. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's so important. Maybe not so much in martial arts, but I think most people have experienced um, this is the situation of bumping into some difficult problem. You know, you're, you're trying to do... Uh, something for work or maybe it was something academic and you bang your head against the wall and you can't get it and you walk away, right? You put it down, you leave it alone, you do something else for a day, a week, a month, you come back and it just happens. Right. And it happens quickly. And we don't tend to think about martial arts being like that, but it can be. Oh, I agree. You know, I mean, even recently I was, uh, posting on Facebook as I was sort of, I was in a frustrating place and I just want, it was literally, literally one sentence, you know, just it's sometimes training is the only answer, you know, <laughs> you know, and that, and I, you know, a lot of people respond to that saying, yep, you know, and just, you just get out there, you, you work hard, you do what you do. And then you walk back into whatever the situation was and it, it with a clearer mind and a new perspective. Yeah. yeah. And if you consider martial arts training to be anything more than the physical, which most people do, then, you know, sometimes your focus isn't on the external pieces. It's on the internal stuff and whatever you've got to do to set your mind right no, I, can I become critical. Agree. Yeah, I fully agree. Okay. So who would you say has been the most influential person? on your martial arts upbringing? Cause you, you've done a bunch of different stuff. We, we heard about how important your father was, you know, so maybe, maybe we'll take him out of the mix cause we've heard a bit about him. Yeah. Well, if, if we, if we take him out, it becomes a hard question. I've had a lot of instructors. I mean, I think my dad's always been that background inspiration because of who he was and what he did in his life. I mean, he did so much more than martial arts. Um, and, uh, so he's always been that background inspiration. Um, I've had, you know, I've had so many great instructors and, and it's, it would be really hard to pick one and say, you know, this person was it or this person was it because they've all brought something else to the picture. Well, tell us about a couple of them then. You know, from the, her, from the earliest inspiration, like, you know, Henry G. R. Shambo, um, who is long gone now, but, uh, you know, he was, he had this great training hall, you know, down in the South end of the city in which I lived, which is Holyoke, Massachusetts. And, you know, I would go there and, you know, he had a gym, so you could go there and like, you know, work out on the weights, you could do things, and then you'd go and have class. And, you know, he was like, really got me of the mindset. He was like super traditional. He ran it in a very, you know, you know, Japanese way, lots, lots of discipline, like, you know, always focused right there. And so it really, 
you know, gave me a formation of like, okay, this is a serious endeavor. This is what we need to do, and this is how we need to do it. And it was really a good framework with which to start. Um, you know, and then I've had instructors like who were much more laid back, like uh, Tom Howdershell, who was a great uh, Japanese, or actually, uh, sorry, Okinawan Gojuru guy. And you know, and he, you know, I got to train with uh, Taro Ruchin and then people because of him, you know, with these other great martial artists. But he was, you know out in Arizona, much more laid back, like not super hyped about. So I, then I learned like, wow, you can be flexible within this environment too. And you know, there's, there's lots of sides to the story. Uh, you know, Peter Krokol, uh, Billy Restucia, you know, again, less formal, but really intense training, you know, along the way. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, and the, I mean, there are others as well, but I think those are probably the main folks who have really just, um, set the stage, you know, for who I've become as a martial artist. Yeah. Now, here's a question that's that's not on the list that I sent you, and I, I hope this is okay. One of the things, you know, because we, we talked before the show that the majority of the listeners, the majority of the martial arts community really comes out of that that Asian ideal, you know, the, the karate, the taekwondo, the kung fu, and, and right. related arts. So when I have the opportunity to talk to someone that has experience with something else – that also has some ties into what most of us consider traditional martial arts, you know, and I'm not saying that to exclude anybody of any kind of art, but I, I think anybody out there listening can agree when people think martial arts, they don't think of Caboeta, they don't think of uh, Salat, they, they don't think of European martial arts. Right. Uh, I, I like to ask some of these perspective questions. Sure. What do you think you brought in to your European martial arts training? Um, let me ask it a different way. What was most beneficial to bring in? What What were you happiest that you had from your time in, in your earlier martial arts when you started training European stuff? I, you know, for me, it's, it was an understanding of body mechanics and power generation um, because that can be applied to anything. And so when you understand how a body function, functions in a martial way and how a body moves, generates power, then you, t you can take that and you understand that the human body just functions in certain ways and it's not different for someone who was training 500 years ago in Japan or you know, 60 years ago in China or wherever that the body mechanics are what they are. Um, the human body functions in certain ways, power generation functions in certain ways, and that applies to all martial techniques and all weapons and all disciplines in that way. And so for me, that was the, that, that foundation um, from the other martial arts really opened my eyes going, wow, you know, you can pick up a 500-year-old European manual on the sword or on the dagger or on the wrestling. You can read it. You can look at the illustrations and go, I know exactly what they're doing here. Like this is, you know, and of course there's some things that you don't, that you need to figure out. But for the most part, you know, some things are, are become blatantly obvious to go, wow, this actually, you know, it just functions. Mm. And it's because of that, that baseline piece um, of, of the body mechanics and power generation. Yeah. Interesting. Now, if you had the opportunity to train with someone, with anybody, uh, you know, be they alive now or someone from history, who would you want to train with? Now, that is a loaded question. It yeah. is. That's why I ask I, it. <laughs> it's a great loaded question because, I mean, you know, here I am. I've picked up and, you know, and I, I'm running mostly from this particular manual from 1570 written by Joaquin Meyer, who was a, a, a fry factor. And he, you know, um, he lived in Germany. And if I could go back and train with this man, I, I would do it in a second because then I, you know, you'd say, you know, am I doing this the way that you did it? Am I, am I doing this the way? Because... Unlike the Eastern traditions, we have no masters to go back to. We have no people to interpret their own writings in that way. Um, you know, we're taking it as, you know, martial artist as we are coming in, picking up these manuals, translating them, looking at them, bringing our own perspectives in martial arts and our body mechanics to them. But is it what our ancestors were doing? And that's the question. You know, mm. is it what, what our ancestors in Europe were doing? Is it what, is it how it was done? And we make a lot of assumptions that it is because it works, but in reality, you'll never actually know. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's a frustrating piece as well, but you'll never actually. So if I could go back and train with Joachim Meyer, Johannes Lichtenauer, you know, any of the German masters, 
that would be something to do because then it, it, you would really validate um, what's being done in, in the community right now. So, Yeah. I, I think it would be fascinating to look kind of side by side to take someone that was considered an expert of, of the modern era right. in those arts and to be able to compare to a master from from the historical era. You know, maybe someday we'll invent time travel and I'll, I'll get that to would, do this. That would be amazing. <laughs> right. But but just to kind of watch and to compare, because I think we all know the differences or, or many of us recognize the differences as martial arts are passed down from in student, from instructor to student. And, and the more hops you get, the more it becomes a game of telephone right. that, you know, slight adjustments, you know, and, and they're they're generally conscious to work with different body mechanics, different height weight right. distributions, personal preferences, things like that. Um, and, and I think some of the hope is, is that by going back to the original source material, you're sort of cutting the line in some way and trying to, you know, skip back and get earlier in that telephone line. Yeah. And what's, you know, come down through history. Yeah. And, and then I, I wonder too about, you know, slight variations. You know, I, I was a, a philosophy major in college and, you know, so, you know, you end up with these incredibly slight variations in translation that become tremendously impactful as you work through the text. And, you know, I'm sure this is this is something that the uh, nerdier because we, yeah. we, we talked before, you know, I, I, th I think everyone that's been listening to the show for a while knows I am a self-proclaimed nerd of, of many things. Oh, OK. And yeah, <laughs> so we're talking that, that the word nerd is is not derogatory in any way, but I. I sense that there's probably some of the nerdier folks coming out of your world that are debating things like that. Sure. And that debate will go on, I think, uh, probably forever. You know, for me, it's, it's like, uh, you know, if you're in a sailboat and you vary your course by one degree, if you're going a short distance, that's not a problem. If you're going a long distance, that long, one degree becomes huge. And so sometimes those variations, uh, you know, as training goes on, may move really far away from, from where the intention was, even though it was a small variation. I mean, it, it's hard to know, you know, but you can always correct your course. So, <laughs> right. Right. Cool. Yeah. Now, how about competition? And this could be either from, you know, from your, your current body of training to, to your past. Has competition been something that you've engaged in? Oh, I love fighting with swords. Okay, cool. Tell it, tell us about it. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. So it's interesting because, um, you know, that is definitely the sport side of the art. Uh, but it's also a place you can pressure test techniques that you've been learning. So you can learn these historical techniques and say, well, can, can this work when someone's not doing what I'm expecting them to do, when they're not responding in a way that I want them to respond? And, um, and that is an amazing thing. And in the early days of HEMA, you just saw certain sets of really basic techniques. And I, and I saw this one in sparring, like there, you know, way back when in, in sparring with karate and different things, there were just a certain set of really basic techniques that people stuck to as a rule to score points to get, you know, to get those things done. And you saw that early on in uh, historical European martial arts. But now you're beginning to see people who move beyond what they call gemein fencing or common fencing to these other more advanced techniques that they're actually pulling off in tournament fighting. And so you're seeing more of that history emerge and more of why these things worked um, as they're pressure tested. And again, you know, you're, you're fighting with blunt steel swords. You're not, you know, stabbing anybody or cutting anybody, but, you know, and you have equipment on, which is another thing that... Uh, there are two types of fighting that, you know, that split off and they're very related. There's, there's a uh, harness fechten and blast fechten. There's fighting in armor and fighting outside of armor. Um, and so we do fighting outside of armor, but necessarily in tournaments, you have to put on, you know, fencing masks, padded gambesons, you know, gloves, things to protect yourself. Otherwise you would, things would break very quickly right. as, as we all know. And so for me, the, the tournament fighting has been, has been, it's been so fun. It's been a way to, to test things. I've gotten to fight some of the most amazing fighters from all around the world. And, and now I have friends from all over the world because mostly because I fought them, uh, which is a great way to make friends. Yeah. I, I think most of us that have spent any time in competition know how, how strong of a bond you can build 
Mm. after uh, beating on or getting beat on by someone else. Yeah. Hopefully it's mutual, but. <laughs> it tends to be. Yeah. 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 Now, has there been any attempt at, at putting different sword styles together? Has, has, has there been anybody that's run a competition that said, you know, kind of a, a, a run what you brung, so to speak, you know, if you want to show up and with a katana or you want to show up with a, yeah, they, they've had some open sword. weapons competitions, okay. um, which have been really interesting uh, because people will do sometimes things that are really, you know, right on historically. Sometimes they'll do things that are just crazy. Uh, I saw a good friend of mine, oh, probably about two or three years ago in Houston, Texas, um, Axel Pedersen, who's probably one of the best fighters in the world. He's from, uh, from Gothenburg, Sweden. And he went into the, um, the open competition and he fought with two bucklers, which are two small shields, so one on either hand. <laughs> against against whatever it was really funny because he's such such an amazing martial artist but the way they did the weapons is that they weighted the points so i mean the buckler would be hard to score a lot of points with so he didn't end up winning anything but uh but it was really it was really something to watch and then you know he's just he's one of the most amazing fighters i've seen i've gotten to fight him on a few occasions and it's just been a, a pleasure to do so um you know he's the guy that went down to mexico and fought three different sword competitions, fought them all left-handed and, and like the princess bride, he's not left-handed, but he won them all. <laughs> so, you know, it just, it was, you know, it just, it was amazing. Uh, cool. yeah. so, so, so yeah, there are those open cell competitions. There are those bring what you want to fight with. Um, in fact, in Houston, I, there's a guy who's resurrecting African martial arts and brought some really crazy, like different swords and sword styles to that particular open, which is really oh, cool. neat. Yeah, it was great. Oh, that sounds really cool. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a lot of value in thinking outside of the box in that way. And while I may not necessarily coach someone to bring it into a competition, I suppose if you're if you're that good, then you might as well. But sometimes when I teach, you know, if I'm teaching sparring, okay, uh, we're just going to work with the left side of our body right now. Yeah. Left hand, left foot only. You know, and, and you start to see the wheels turning for people. So I, I had a sense of that, you know, somebody holding two shields. Okay, so what are the advantages there? What are the disadvantages? You know, there's some great defense, but you're kind of limited range-wise, you know. Uh, and, and I appreciate anyone that's going to step outside their comfort zone like that. And, and you bring up a good point as well because um, there's a big movement right now in the historical European martial arts community to develop a coaching culture. And it's coming along nicely where people are becoming um, better and better coaches, not only... Um, teaching and instructing in that way, but also in competitions, you know, when you're right there. So, I mean, I, you know, a good friend of mine who made the finals at Long Point, um, which is the, one of the biggest, the biggest gathering in the U.S., certainly, of uh, historical European martial artists, and it happens in um, Maryland usually, or, or Washington, D.C. area, but usually in Maryland. And uh, so my friend... Uh, who's not, not of my school at all. I'm not, you know, we don't go to the same school. He's, you know, he's in New York. I'm here. He tapped me to be his coach for the long sword in the finals. He was fighting uh, Christian Rokinen from Finland and he wanted some coaching on that. And I'm like, sure. And so I, so that whole coaching piece, that whole stepping outside the box, like that development of a coaching culture, which is already sort of there in Eastern martial arts is still really coming along in the Western, but it's really, it's growing rapidly. And it's something that I'm, I'm loving to see develop. Oh, that's, that's really neat. You know, we heard a little bit about long point on, on a previous episode. And if you've been listening to the show for a while, uh, you, you may recognize, you know, some of these terms and, and, and I don't remember the episode number off the top of my head. I apologize, but Sir Gemini Asante came on a gentleman out of California who does historical European martial arts. And he told us a little bit about some of this competition stuff. So I'm going to link that episode in the show notes for this one. If you're new to the show, we drop all those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So you can find links to everything we're talking about today over there. And I'll, I'll find some video and some photos and, and we'll drop all kinds of good stuff over there to make it worth your while. But please continue. Oh, and also there's a, um, the New York Times did a, a video uh, article at Long Point. It was probably three years ago now and so that really is yeah two or three years ago now and it really just that brought forward a lot of what's going on so that might be something else you could link out to as well oh that'd be cool yeah i'll, I'll look for that 
Yeah, it was a great piece. It was a really great piece. So. Wonderful. So the competition is 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 heating up, so to speak. How, you know, what would what is this this long point competition look like in terms of number of attendees? Is this a, a hundred people? Is this a thousand people? Uh, well, I think last year there were uh, probably over two hundred fighters there. Okay, and so that's... It, it gets pretty big, and and I think next year it's going to be even larger. They're moving to a bigger venue in downtown Baltimore because this venue can no longer accommodate the amount of competitors that want to be here. Um, th there's a lot of movement in the community. I mean, there's in Gothenburg, Sweden. There's a huge competition, probably the biggest in the world, called Swordfish. Um, happens usually in October. That's a huge one. Um, this past year, um, you know, they got together Long Point South, which happened in Orlando. It happened again, I think it was the end of September, early October. But what that was was almost a, uh, a national championship. And it was, it was televised along with a larger martial arts competition on, I think it was ESPN2. Oh, okay, so that, that would probably be the U.S. Open. Yeah, I think it was the U.S. And, and, yeah. so, it was, and so at the end of that, you had um, the finals for the historical European martial arts. And uh, two of my good friends, uh, Jake Norwood and Lee Smith, fought in that final. And uh, that was uh, oh, cool. It's really it's interesting to see. So if people have watched that, they may have actually seen that competition happen. Cool. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's fascinating to me is how quickly what you do is growing. You know, because when we when we talk about karate, taekwondo, when we, when we talk about really any of these other martial arts, even if if you can draw a line and say, you know, this art was started in this year by this person, there's still quite a bit of experience and, and instruction that led to them developing that style. Right? right. But here, what we have with what you're doing, somebody found a book and started translating it. Right. And it wasn't that long ago. I mean, so we're, we're talking really like 20, 30 years, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe even fewer than that. I mean, you definitely have some pioneers who are in it for a very long time. People like, you know, like Matt Gallus and Scott Brown and different people like that who have been in this forever. Jake Norwood. I mean, people, there are people who have been, had this interest for a long time. You know, many of the people in Europe as well. Um, those are all Americans that I mentioned, but the, you know, have, have been digging into the stuff for a while. And it, for, I think for the longest time it was sort of underground and quiet. And then oh, I think in the, it began to emerge in the, early 2000s from sort of the caves, you know, of, you know, of, of that beginning. And, you know, there was no equipment, there was no support for these folks. Like they had to sort of craft swords and try to get specifications and make measurements, you know, go to museums and make measurements and try to figure out what these people worked with and how they trained. So there was definitely uh, that. And now we have so many companies producing quality training swords, you know, quality protective equipment, all these, all these different things. And, it's. I think this is this is like you know the seventies and eighties in in the uh, if you compare it to the Eastern martial arts where the you know in, in the United States where you know you had all of these you know martial artists coming here and beginning to teach and there was this just upswing in interest and everybody was so excited and there was this fervor you know around these these martial arts coming to the United States and people learning them and, and teaching them and you know that's kind of where we are. There's this piece of. Uh, a very rapid movement and it's and it's interesting because you know you don't know where it's where it's going to end up but but for now there is a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement and uh you know and there's a lot of good stuff going on yeah yeah it's it's cool it's cool and i'm looking forward to seeing what happens over the next 10 20 years you know because as a martial arts community really as, as a world we seem to be embracing these um non-traditional traditional martial arts you know um you know the filipino martial arts have gotten incredibly popular right and, and and the european martial arts are getting popular and and that's bringing all this other stuff with it there's been this um reinterest in indian martial arts which uh I, i'm not even gonna try to pronounce it um it starts with a k it's got like 15 letters and i think 13 of them are vowel uh, uh Vowels, yeah. It, it's just Kalarapayatu something, right? right? It, it's I, I'm butchering it. But, right. you know, people are just almost looking under rocks to say, what have we missed? Right. And to me, that's just awesome. And, and I fully agree because, you know, everything can bring something new 
to the mix and everything can bring something new to, to, to the martial arts. And, and I think that's amazing. And if somebody's excited about a martial art that they've discovered more power to them, you know, go train, bring it out, show everybody, you know, share it with everybody. That's, you know, that's what keeps the community going. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you like martial arts movies? You mentioned the princess bride back there. Well, I mean, I'm, those, it, it, it's a hard thing because, you know, since they started training in European martial arts, whenever I see sword fighting from a Western perspective in movies and TV shows, so anything from Game of Thrones to Princess Bride, it uh, it becomes a, a, a different, uh, <laughs> you have a different perspective and go, oh, you know. Because I'm sure none of the rest of us can relate to that. Well, yeah, yeah. None yeah. of none of us have ever been shushed in a movie theater for for right. you know, like I, that won't I, work. I know, I know. <laughs> I, 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 we've all been there, and you watch that and go, oh. But you know, the funny thing about mentioning the Princess Bride is they he uh, Inigo Montoya actually mentions real sources, really, like real, like you know, oh, you must study Capofero. You know, he's he's actually referring to real uh, rapier sources. Oh, neat. It's, yeah, so when you when, if when you go back and you listen to the list of what he says, you know, I'm using this defense that he's actually referring to real, um, you know, European martial arts sources. <laughs> so I thought that I found that funny, and that was one of the funnier things in in uh, in retrospect, uh, in seeing that movie and going back, going, oh wow, he's actually referring to uh, you know things you can pick up and read. <laughs> That's cool. Like, you know, that 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 gives me a whole different perspective on that movie. And yeah. Yeah, so for, you know, free martial arts movies are uh, some of them are, are hard to swallow, um, and so I one of my favorite ones is one that's just completely irreverent. It just is it's making fun of everything. It it uh, so and I, I think it was brilliant in in what it did for the time. It was Kung Pao Enter the Fist, where you have yeah. <laughs> this guy loose reading himself into a martial arts movie and being ridiculous, and I I thought it was hilarious. I mean, that was you know by far because I think. I've run into a lot of martial artists in my life that take themselves way too seriously. And, and, and that's okay for them, I guess. But for, you know, in terms of like developing community, sharing information and working with people, that doesn't always work out. And so that's why, you know, Kung Pao always reminds me to, you know, have that lighthearted irreverence, you know, have some, have some play in there too. Yeah. You can be serious, realize it's a martial art and do your thing, but also, What's the likelihood of you getting into a real sword fight with sharp swords? Probably not pretty high, I'm going to say. You know, it's probably not going to happen in that way. So, you know, it's it's great to train hard, but it's also great to, uh, you know, to be less serious about it. And, you know, some of the I, I've heard it said that, you know, a, an instructor in uh, in Japan, uh, Masaki Hatsumi, says you need to train with the eyes and mind of a three year old. And that is interesting. That means, you know, everything's new, everything's fresh, and there's a sense of, like, play and openness and fun to what you're doing, even though you're training martial arts. Mm. So I, I think that uh, for, for martial arts movies, I think Kung Pao is going to have to be the uh, <laughs> my choice. It's, it, it is a, a quiet classic. Yeah. It's one that I suspect in, in another 10 years or so people will, will really – rediscover i i saw it in the theater and oh that, and, that's awesome uh that's... the the hamster chuck <laughs> scene and anybody yeah. that's that's seen it knows what i'm talking about yep that is just hilarious <laughs> do you have any favorite actors um you know i i think i go in less for actors and more for acting you know so when it comes to movies like you know i there, there are very few, if you're talking purely martial arts movies, there are very few martial arts movies that have really great acting in it. But I do, so this relates back to hobbies. I do like um, like movies as well, and I like I like really good acting and, and you know, actors and actresses. And um, So less than any, or, or, you know, not any specific person per se, but more about, you know, how well they can relate a story for me. If, if I'm watching um, a movie or, you know, a really good TV drama and I'm really hating the person on the screen, they're doing a good job. You know, they're, they're, they're doing something to me that's like, you know, if I'm really loving who they are, that mm -hmm. means I'm really getting a relationship to who they are. And, and it's not the actor or actress, but it's their character. And they brought that character forth so much that they're making you, they're pulling these emotions out of you and these feelings out of you in the situations. And that, for me, is, is what it's all about, is if there's, there's some great acting going on, um, that's, that's what I really enjoy. So I'd have to say, as far as, you know, actors or actresses, I don't have any 
particular ones, but if something is really well acted, then yeah, you know, I'll, I get it. I'll lose myself in it in some way or another. Which is I get right. it. Totally. Yeah. Now books. I mean, you, you, you guys certainly have you, you in the European martial arts community certainly have a different perspective on books yeah. than a lot of martial artists. Totally. Well, so for me, obviously the books that I would go for would be those original European sources. Um, you know, and, and I have several ones and several variations of some translated, some not. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, some of these things are, are difficult because I'm, I'm relatively functional in German, but that translates only a little bit to middle high German, which a lot of these mm. things are written. in. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's a stretch, but it's, it's good to get your hands on the originals as well because every translator brings some sort of bias to it. And if you can look at some of these things in their original source forms and translate them for yourself as best you can, you'll, you may get a whole different perspective from them. So, you know, those, those kinds of things. And some of the earlier books that, that influenced my martial arts were things like The Sword and the Mind and, and books like that, you know, um, you know, Zen and the Martial Arts, like that, you know, those, those, those kinds of books that are, you know, they they were definitely influential in in uh, early formation of mindset and training, but now uh, you know I, I delve into the the European sources and and try to really get what they were trying to relate to their students at the time. Mm -hmm. We actually did a, a whole uh, short episode on Zen and the martial arts. Our, our Thursday episodes are condensed, you know, kind of topic driven, and spent some time uh, compiling all of the answers that, that guests had given to that question, you know, books. And we also did actors and movies, but Zen and the martial arts was the number one book that our yeah. guests had picked. Well, it's, uh, it looks like I'm among them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's an incredible, book. incredible book. Yeah, I agree. And there's, there's quite a story behind it. So if you're someone that has read that book or, uh, you know, wants to read that book, it, I, I think it's like a 10 minute episode that we, we put out, uh, what's that? 146. I think it's episode 146. We'll link it in the show notes. Great. I'll go back. And there's, I'll there's quite a story behind that book. Uh, the author was, um, a pretty big deal. And I, and I don't think very many people realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll look forward to listening. Cool. Do you have any martial arts related goals? Any, anything driving you forward? Well, I mean, you know, I, uh, Oddly enough, I just turned 50 a few days ago. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And I, I think, you know, I really want to, uh, I, want to I want to continue to compete as long as I can. And uh, I think some of my goals are really just to get out there and win one against these younger guys. I mean, there's a lot of younger fighters. They're in their, you know, 20s. They're in their 30s. They're amazing. You know, they're at the peak of their abilities. And... You know, I'm I'm edging around. You know, I've, I've in some competitions I've come in third. I've been fifth. I'm like right. You know, I'm sort of right there, and uh, and I'd really like to get out there and get to one of the larger competitions and actually win one uh, before my fighting days end. <laughs> so I think that's definitely a goal. And then just just to train. I mean, the, the winning the winning one is just sort of for fun. You know, just to get out there and say, hey, I did it. You know, I did that. Are there um, age divisions? Uh, well, they're starting, Okay. Uh, uh, you know, and so there are that, so they're, so they're going to be, you know, they could literally talk, like, yeah, you can still fight in any open competition, but I can now be tossed into a master's division now that I made 50. And some of the first ones happened at a, a gathering in Boston area called Iron Gate Exhibition, which happens every uh, September, October, and sometime in the autumn, depending on timings. And uh, so they had this. I was there this past year and I wasn't 50 and they're all, they're all saying, oh, you sorry, you can't fight in the masters yet. You know? And then uh, a friend of mine who teaches in long Island, Brad Rangel, he just said, he goes, you know, after you get into this, we're going to call it the Charles Murdoch uh, winning division, basically. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, sure, Brad, I, you know, that's fine. But you know, that's not true. But, um, and so, you know, so the, so there is that happening now. There is, there is a division where you're, you're moving that way, but that, that's, that's not the one I want to win. <laughs> You know, I, you. I, I want to go up against, again, you know, the best in the world and just be able to, you know, do what I do and have them do what they do and, and uh, come out on top. That would be fantastic. Well, I wish you luck with that. And thank you. Hopefully we'll we'll see some photos some point soon of, of you holding up. A, a, is, it, is it a trophy? Is it a medal? Is it a severed head? No. How do you guys do it? <laughs> severed heads would be great. But no, uh, that would be a pretty short competition. 
Yeah, but it, yeah, it, they they give medals out at most of the competitions. Okay. So that's, what? I, I didn't mean it had to be an actual severed head from your opponent. It could be you know a a plastic severed head you know in, in lieu of a trophy. Here's a funny thing that about I think it was almost five years ago. It was either the last Boston Boston sword gathering, which became IGX, or um, or the first IGX, which is the Iron Gate exhibition. Um, they actually gave out skulls, like little rubber skulls of people, <laughs> and uh, and I have a. In the skull, I have for I don't know what what it, what it was that I did. I did some comp. I think I did a dagger competition there and some other things, and and I medaled in it. Um, you know, I, I have one. I have one dagger competition, but I want to win a sword competition. Um, and I got the skull of of uh, Jason Vale. Now, if you look at uh, there's a book called Medieval Dagger Combat, which is which is written by Jason Vale. He's he's a great like dagger fighting guy, great martial artist. He's a great fighter. I think he's probably in his sixties now, maybe. And just a, a great martial artist all around, and uh, so I, I have his skull, <laughs> 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 which is funny. I mean, it just, it just certainly did it as a joke. They had, you know, the people who were instructing that you're signing these skulls, and they were part of the prizes as you did things. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know that I could be involved in in putting on a competition like this without uh, my sense of humor coming like, through and, and and a strong sense of sarcasm, because I, you know, there's just. I mean, it, it happens in, in other martial arts, too. You know, I mean, we see in the movies that, you know, there's all this tongue-in-cheek stuff. And, you know, what's the plot of every kung fu movie? You know, you dishonored or, or killed my, my master. Right. And so now I have to kill your whole family or something. Right, exactly. You know, so yeah. we're, we're just, we're kind of used to ha- tying martial arts to a sense of humor. And, and I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with that. I think that's really funny. And that's what I definitely appreciated that when that was done those years ago. Good. Yeah, definitely. So. Good. So tell us a, a little bit more about you. If you know, if, if someone wants to to learn from you, I don't know if you offer seminars. Uh, you know, this is what we call commercial time. So, all right. Well, commercial time. So um, we have a group of uh, people that I teach, and we meet Tuesday and Thursday nights um, in in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, but that class is for people who have had some experience in some way. So what I do um, is I teach about eight week beginner courses. Uh, we just finished one up, so we have sort of a, a new feed of people coming in, and I'm trying to arrange one in the next year, and, and I'll, I'll get you the information as that happens, but I think it's, be great. it may happen actually at Champlain College, which would be a great place to do it. Um, but uh, So I'll be offering a new beginner's class, and that's sort of the feed into the regular classes um, that we do. So um, because it's, it's been it, – one of my frustrations has been a constant influx of new people uh, into – before I did beginner's classes into the other class, and you have to go back and start teaching the basics to this person while you have these people who are intermediate and advanced and not getting the instruction that they're needing at that point. And so there was too much of a, of a fracturing of the class for me. Mm. Yeah. And so I had to sort of say, all right, we're going to do beginner's class, that's the feed into the main classes, and, and we go from there. Okay. Any, any social media, websites, you know, if people want to get a hold of you directly? Uh, they can get a hold of me. There's the, there's the Grunberg Freifechter Facebook group. Um, uh, you know, don't don't con- worry, folks. We will link that. I'm yeah, not. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And, I mean, they can contact me on Facebook, too. You know, at Charles Murdoch, basically. They can find me on Facebook and contact me directly. And we can I, I put out, you know, announcements and things like that in different places when beginner's classes are happening. Um, don't really have a web presence in terms of website yet, but we're kind of working on that. And okay. We'll get there. Cool. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today, and thank you for sharing everything you did. And Do you have any parting advice for the people listening? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for having me on the show. It's been an honor to be here, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And, you know, on the side of just, you know, just goes back to what we've talked about today. You know, just keep training hard. You know, don't worry about rank or advancement or plateau. Just Get out there, learn, do what you do. Have have a passion and enthusiasm. Um, people always say, find your passion, and, and that's sort of a, of a misnomer in a lot of ways. I think what you do is you find what you enjoy in, in life, and then you infuse it with your passion. And so if you're a martial artist, bring your passion to it. You know, Bring it in there, infuse it. Uh, train hard and keep going. You can do it for a lot of years. Trust me, I know. The more I speak with folks in the HEMA community, the more I feel that we're doing ourselves as martial arts overall a disservice by drawing such strong lines between different arts and styles. I really appreciated Mr. Murdoch's ability to put HEMA in context for those of us that haven't participated outside 
of Asian martial arts. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch, for your time on the show today. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with Mr. Murdoch's contact info, links to information on the Long Point tournament we talked about, that New York Times video on HEMA, and some cool photos of Mr. Murdoch doing what he does best. And in one of them, we even get to see him cutting bamboo with a longsword. How cool is that? You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And our username is Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show. So if you want to come on or recommend someone else, maybe your instructor or somebody else you know that's got some great stories, hit the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you have any feedback, we want to hear that too. You can do so on the website or email us, info at whistlekick.com, whichever is easiest for you. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing. And if you're up to give us something back, kind of as a thank you for all the work we're doing for you, maybe you could share the show with a friend, leave us a review. iTunes is the best place for that. You could join the newsletter list if you haven't already. Get in on that Facebook group. You could like us on Facebook. Uh, you could you could make a purchase. Um, you could suggest a guest. I mean, really, there's a lot of ways to help build this community that we're out here building. Why? To grow the martial arts. We've said it before on the show. I'll say it here again because I found myself saying it quite a bit this weekend at an event. Our goal is to grow the martial arts, to keep people involved in martial arts, so we have more people to sell to. It's really a, a win-win. We're just going to keep turning everything we can back into the community, growing martial arts, making martial arts something even bigger, even better, even more supportive, because that's a good business model for us to have, don't you think? Seriously, if you haven't been over to the website recently, if you haven't checked out the new gear, the new Horizon colorway that we put together, see this preview photo of, from that recent photo shoot we did. It's it's awesome. Every time I look at it, I just come away going, wow, this is something we did that nobody else has. I'm so proud of it, if you can't tell. Until next time, though, train hard, smile, and have a great day.